Barb Higgins here, welcoming you to A Thousand Tiny Steps. In this podcast, I share my stories of love, loss, triumph, and tragedy as I continue to trace my steps backward and ponder what led to the death of my daughter, Molly. If you're ready to laugh, cry, shake your head in disbelief, or simply listen, and tie, buckle, slip on, or lace up your shoes, and join me as we begin our A Thousand Tiny Steps. Hey everybody, Barb Higgins here, welcoming you to episode 108 of A Thousand Tiny Steps. <sighs> so I'm starting with a big sigh. Yesterday was an incredibly wonderful and difficult day, or the last 36 hours, quite honestly. So you all know that I've written a book and that it's in the process of you know being printed and all of that. So what they do, what the company does, the publishing company, is you get a copy of the book but it's not for sale. And it says across the top, not for resale. And it's not corrected. It's printed as it came off the computer. And then you read the book, you go through the book and you find the mistakes that still exist. And it's amazing how many mistakes still exist in a hard printed book. How do I know this? Because earlier this week, Virginia got a copy of the book. So if you're watching, ta-da, here it is, Motherland, my book, front and back. So this gray stripe across the middle is what says not for resale. So here it is. This is the cover I chose. Those of you that watch my podcast are seeing it before anyone else. I have to be honest, I, I can hold it now without crying. But when Virginia sent me the text of her holding the book, I just started to cry because all of Molly's story is here. And that's the piece of it. It's in here. It's in a book. This is a book. I am surrounded in my office by books. I at two bookshelves in front of me. I have two on either side behind me. I have bookshelves in the living room, in the playroom, everywhere. Every room in my house has books. So it, it was emotional for me. And of course, bittersweet. I would prefer not to have to have had to write a book. I would prefer that Molly be alive. I, you know, I, all of you know this who listen to me and know my story. It was exciting to me, like, oh my gosh, it's printed. And I was gone coaching. We texted back and forth a bit when, when I was at, at Amesbury and everything. And so I came home and I walk into the kitchen and on the kitchen table is Motherland. So I'm like, oh my gosh. Virginia had put it there. So I just assumed Kenny had seen it. Well, he hadn't seen it or he hadn't noticed it. And I'm like, Kenny, look, Kenny, look. And I pick it up and he goes, what? And I show it to him and he's like, <gasps> his eyes get big. So he grabs it and he wants to sit down and read it. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm hungry. Feed me. <laughs> so we looked at it a little bit and I took a selfie with it and sent it to Virginia and I put it on my Instagram and Facebook story. And I'll probably put it there again and make some posts out of it. But it was intense. It was intense. And so as I went to bed, it was just all in my mind. And so I have to read it as well. And I've only read four chapters so far. I've had the book in my hand. I'm going on day two now. Because every time I read it, I'm right back in it. And, and all the emotions come back. And so much of the emotions are still unresolved for me. I'm still so angry. Angry at myself and angry at them. And so I'm just, you know, it puts me back when I could, could have still saved her. If only, if only, if only. And I know that, you know, I need to stop with the if onlys, but I can't. I mean, I can I'm doing better at stopping at the if onlys, but I believe that I will have those feelings for the rest of my life. I read a beautiful article written by Barbara Bush about losing her, her four-year-old daughter, Robin, and in her 80s, she's still, if only, if only, if only, what if, what if, what if. So, you know, that gives me incredible permission to grieve just the way I'm going to and however I want to. I was getting ready for coaching. I had to get up early. And so I got my lunch all made took a shower. I was, I was completely sort of ready. And I had some time and Jack hadn't woken up, but I knew that he might. And so I'm sitting down drinking my coffee and I pull out my phone and I'm scrolling on Facebook and I belong to a group called Friends of Vinnie Myers Support Group. And Vinny is a boy who died three years prior to Molly. His dad and that, that Facebook group saved me, utterly saved me in the early days of my grief. His dad was still active at that time on the Compassionate Friends and a group called the loss of adult and young adult children. There are these different grief groups, which I mention a lot of them in the book. In the weeks after Molly died and I started spending all day, every day sitting in my yard doing nothing but looking at my phone or drinking, <laughs> he stood out to me. He was just so, so verbal and he shared everything. And he was still in a bad place at that time. He also wasn't super healthy. He had had a couple of open heart surgeries. He had had some health issues as a, as a young, young man. His health was always an issue. And I know that Vinny's death really decimated his health. As the years went by, he's somebody that just stayed a support for me. And I developed my little circle of moms and dads. So it was Marilee and her mother, Lisa, Jack and his mother, Brandy, Molly and her mother, Kathy. That's my sort of core group there. And then my Molly and me. 
when I had my brain surgery, all those children came came to me. Molly and Jack all chit chatted because they're all thirteen. Big Molly brought her dogs with her, her dog, and my Molly was worried that I'd get itchy. And Big Molly said, "Don't worry, spiritual dogs don't cause allergies." And and Vinny just made us all laugh. He sort of never stopped talking. He just was kind to everybody. And I remember Jack was sort of soothing and comforting and, and Marilee was curious and Marilee and Molly talked, they all talked about all the things they had in common. So I remember waking up and my college roommate, Tanya was with me and she asked me, who's Vinny? You know, that was the first name that stuck out to her. And I realized whatever I was seeing, I had been talking about. I remember sending a, a video to those parents and saying, I mean, not a video, like a recording, like a Facebook message recording of my voice, sharing that experience. I'm scrolling through and I see on that page, or I see on one of my angel mom's page, a tribute to E.R. Myers and how sad we are that, you know, sorry, Big Ed, that your dad died. So when I think Big Ed, I think of E.R., Vinny's dad, but Vinny's son, Edward Jr., is who they call Big Ed because he's a big guy. And Vinny was Vinny and then Edward was E.R. So I thought that it was E.R.'s dad. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he just lost his mother and now his dad died? Oh no. Well, no, what happened, his... ER just lost his mother and his last post was maybe 36 hours before he died. He was talking about his mom and how hard it was and how much he was going to miss her and that he hoped it was okay to use the Vinnie Myers page to talk about his mom, which it's his page. He can talk about whatever he wants. But I'm looking at the post and it dawns on me that this is ER and I, and I just stand perfectly still and I have a physical reaction to it. I get chills and my neck hairs go up and my heart starts to pound and my mouth gets dry and, and I'm just standing there. And so I look at, I think it was a woman named Lynn, it was her post and I read it and it's a GoFundMe to raise money because they've been, they've been struggling financially and now ER is gone. And oh my God, I just was a basket case. So Big Ed, Ed Jr. found his dad in the garage. He had had a heart attack. They rushed him to the hospital. He didn't survive. And I'm heartbroken. I mean, wrecked. So I did a Facebook Live on the way down to coaching yesterday, which today is September 2nd. So that would have been September 1st if you want to go look at it. And I just cried. I couldn't keep it together. I, I, it's just one more person that's gone. Now, part of me is wicked happy for him because he gets to be with Vinny and with his mom. He and his mom died just a week apart. And there's something tender and special about that as well. So I know that he is just ridiculously happy and he has all the answers. And I wish he could come and tell me how Molly's doing. You know, like, <laughs> except there's like uh, 500 kids that he's helped their parents cope with their deaths. I tell you, ER is an angel on earth. He, he took his son's death and, and helped countless people. There were people in the support group that hadn't even lost children, but that had suffered trauma that ER recognized needed help and needed the kind of support that parents that have lost children could so easily give. In 12 hour period, my book is in my hands and ER has died. The other piece is I let all these moms know, moms and dads know that I mentioned them in the book, that there's a whole chapter about my, my island. He was so excited, so excited and proud of me. Please send me a copy. Please send me a copy when it comes out. I'm so honored. Thank you so much. And he's gone. So here I am tasked with two things that bring me right back to Molly's death. The book, which is all about it and about Jack, but you know, about all that was going on in my life when Molly died. And now the first parent I met online was him. It wasn't even a mom. It was a dad. He's gone now too. So it was hard for me. It was just hard on me. So I had thought of doing a little teaser with the book and I'm going to, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the chapter, just one, that talks about my island, about the people in my life that I met in the weeks and months after Molly died and how much they helped me. And it will give you a little taste of what the book is like. So it's chapter 32 and it's called My Perfect Island. And what's neat is the graphic is a little ladybug, which maybe you can see it, maybe you can't. So ER... Mama Jules, Big Ed, Vinny, this is for you. And for all the moms and dads out there that lost kids. It's strange that in the weeks after Molly's death, I often felt closer to complete strangers than I did to my friends and family. I lived on Facebook. I know how people feel about social media, that it can be a cruel and damaging place, a place that can do more harm than good. But for me, it was a lifeline. People messaged me constantly about Molly. It helped me feel connected and cared for and understood. And it felt like Molly's memory was being kept alive too. People weren't forgetting about her. And then a few people mentioned some online grief groups that were part of what helped them when they lost a child. Those groups turned out to be one of the most important parts of my grief journey. 
I'm not sure how I could have survived without them. I feel that way still. Here at last were people, mothers mostly, but a few fathers too, who understood. All the sympathy and empathy in the world from family and friends can't get to this place of understanding what it's really like to lose a child. The first group I found is called Compassionate Friends. It's one of the oldest support groups out there. I joined a few others. Ellie's way was especially important to me, but I think I was part of 15 or so groups in all. I was hungry to find people who saw me and what I'd been through and to learn from those who were trying to live after the worst thing that life can throw at you had happened. Certain families and children stood out to me and have become friends. And more than that, I've grown to love the lost children. I see them as having a kinship with Molly. I have their faces on my fridge, on Christmas ornaments, on coffee mugs. Most of us have set up foundations to raise money for good causes and attempt to make something good come from our loss. We sell bracelets and t-shirts and stickers, and we support each other. Vinny died in March 2013. He was a high school senior. His brother had already graduated, and they were driving home from an award ceremony at their school. They had a disagreement of some sort, and Vinny got out of the car and decided to walk home. On his walk home, he got hit by a car and died. This was three years before Molly's death. So Vinny's dad, ER, who was in the group, was someone I looked to as having gotten through the days and months and years without his son. I needed to see what it was like to survive, to go through the depths of grief and somehow come out the other side and try to make something positive of life, knowing that the pain and the loss will always be there. The next person I met online was a little girl, Molly's age, called Marilee. She lived in Missouri. Her story was similar to Molly's. She was the same age. She'd had terrible headaches. But unlike Molly, she had never had the opportunity for life support. One day she was there, an aneurysm burst, and then she was gone. Marilee, like Molly, had sought medical help prior to the rupture. Perhaps if she had been given a scan, they could have saved her. Marilee's mother, Lisa, read my posts and the story of my lawsuit with keen interest. She asked me questions about everything that had happened during and after Molly's death. And I realized that in some ways, it had been easier for her. I'd had a fight to channel my grief into, a lawsuit to occupy our time and our minds and to distract us from our sadness, someone to be angry at besides myself. Both Vinnie and Marilee had been known for their kindness as kids, a quality which doesn't come as easily to children as we might think. I remember saying to myself, why can't it be the shitty kids who die? Which is awful and wrong, I know. No child deserves to die and no child is shitty. They're still growing into themselves and learning how to be in the world and much of their behavior is conditioned by their circumstances. But still, I had the thought because we do when these amazing kids die. Kids who are loved, kids who are known for their goodness and kindness and for the light they bring to their worlds. Kids like Vinny and Marilee and my Molly. And then there was Jack. He died in August 2016, a few months after Molly. I saw his mom's name and her story pop up on Facebook late that summer, and it hit me. This is still happening all over the world, every day, every second of every day. Children are dying. For me, when my Molly died, it felt like the world stopped like nothing worse could ever happen. But the truth is that there are over 7 billion people living on the planet. 2.2 billion of those people are children. And every year, over 10 million of those children die. UNICEF recently released the statistic that a child under the age of 15 dies every five seconds. Not that this horrifying statistic lands with us. Statistics rarely do. It's the individual stories that matter and our connection to them. Which is why I'm writing this book, not because my Molly's death was any more tragic than any of those other 10 million deaths that happened in 2016, but because one individual story sheds light and makes sense and sensitizes us to the whole. And it's why these grief groups and these dead children I came to learn about and their grieving parents mean so much to me. They are real individual stories that I can see and feel and learn about. They are made real to me, and that helps me feel less alone which, when all is said and done, is the purpose of all good stories and all good human connections. So when I learned about Jack, it really hit home. This will keep happening. Children will keep dying. And this is my world now, my community, my island. And as strange as it might sound, talking to those other grieving parents was the very first time I felt relief. I understood that no matter how kind or well-meaning or sympathetic people were, only they could understand the hell of living with child loss. I wanted to be with them, to share our feelings and our truths and our struggles. 
During that first summer and in the months and years that followed, if I could have designed a perfect island, it would have had me and those grieving parents on it and no one else. It was only with them that I felt seen and heard and understood, that I could breathe. People who I knew I would never have to explain myself to because they just knew. Jack was 13 too, like Molly and Marilee. His mother had left him and his sister Lily with their grandparents, and while they were there, Jack went to play in the woods with friends. There was a firearm involved, and it went off, and Jack was shot in the neck. The children involved were so scared that they ran away and didn't tell anyone about Jack until it was too late. He bled to death on his own in the woods. If he'd had medical attention earlier, he might still be alive today. Sometimes it's people's stories I'm drawn to, or a connection to a parent, and the way they grieve that resonates and speaks to me. For some reason, it was Jack's picture that made me sit up and take notice. He was 13 when he died, but he still looked like a little boy, a beautiful boy with a sweet, open expression, a little boy who, like Molly, should never have died. Brandy, Jack's mother, and I connected immediately, and she was drawn to the pictures of Molly that I posted, too. I think we both suspected that, in a different world, they would have been friends. Perhaps they are now. Over the years, Jack and his name would come to hold a very, very special place in our new molly family. I spent as much time as I could online with those families. We messaged each other in the middle of the night and at special moments that were hard for us. We might never meet, but we are still there for each other in a profound way. Being part of those groups helped, and I would encourage anyone who has lost a child or has lost anyone, even those of you who aren't so keen on connections, to find a grief group that suits you. The online nature helps those of us who are grieving. Oftentimes, you just don't feel like getting out of bed or having a shower or getting into a car or being sociable or forming part of an in-person group. Doing all those things can be helpful, but more times than not, you just want to be able to reach out, no matter what state you're in, no matter what time of the day or night it is, and to feel connected to someone who understands. These Facebook groups did that for me. And then another Molly died at 29. Her mother, Kathy was connected to me through a colleague of mine who was her Molly's cousin. I have a mug with her Molly on it, and she has a Molly B hoodie. These connections came to mean so much to me. There were people in my community too, people I knew or would come to know. When Molly died, John, a local friend, reached out to me. I remember when his son, Nat, died by suicide. The story haunted me, and I'd reached out to him to express my sympathy. Looking back now, with a dead child of my own, I realized how inadequate my words were. I wasn't to blame for not finding the right words, just like those around me who haven't lost children who are trying to comfort me aren't to blame for when their words fail. They just can't understand, which is okay. Which is a good thing. The fewer people who have to experience and so can empathize with child loss, the better. But John and others who had lost children around me were now part of my club, my island. I got them in a whole new way and I saw them cropping up everywhere. A bit like when you're pregnant for the first time and you see big bellies everywhere, or when you buy an orange car and suddenly there are orange cars all over the highway. Parents who experienced child loss began to cross my path. When I went to Molly's grave at the cemetery one day, I met two mothers who had lost their sons. They became friends when their children died. We shared our stories. I told them about Molly. And after that, they told me that they always stopped by Molly's grave to say hello and to send up a prayer. I go to their son's graves too now and have left flowers. As people, we couldn't have been more different. They were bikers, part of those hard-drinking, hard-partying New Hampshire people whom I typically wouldn't have crossed paths with. But we're part of the same island now. We were more than friends. When we saw each other in town, we stopped and hug each other without even needing to say a word. No one should ever have to lose a child. It's the most cruel and unnatural of things. But there are situations that arise from losing a child that deepen your humanity, recognizing the superficial barriers that separate us from others the barriers that can be torn down in an instant when a shared experience like child loss has given me a much deeper connection to everyone in the world. It has made me more open and compassionate and accepting. My island, though small in its membership and exclusive in its requirement, you need to have a dead child, is in every other way the most inclusive island in the world. So that's chapter 32 of Motherland. And I think to this day, when I'm really struggling and I post on Facebook, I don't want any of my friends and family that have not lost children to stop posting, please. I get love and comfort from all of it. And, and every comment lets me know that you still care. But there is something in the responses of 
moms and dads that have lost children that that comforts immediately. And I think it's just the connection. Just before I recorded this podcast, I was reading what's the definition of love. And a little four-year-old told a story about his next door neighbor whose wife died and he saw his neighbor crying and he went and sat up in his lap. He just went and sat in his lap. This little four-year-old girl went and sat in his lap. And the mother said, what are you doing? And she goes, nothing. I'm just helping him cry, (laughs) helping him cry. But sometimes that's what I need. I need someone to help me cry. I don't need to be told to stop crying. I don't need to be told to move on. I don't need to be told enough time has passed. I don't need to be told that I can choose to be happy if I want to. Those things are so hard for me to hear sometimes. That's where Motherland comes in, right? Motherland, this beautiful book. So I'm excited about it. By the time you hear this episode, it's the end of September. And hopefully I'll have more information at that time as to when the book will actually come out. Events around that. I want to read it. I want to be one, the one that reads it on Audible. And just reading that one chapter, it's hard. I tend to read ahead. I'm a really fast reader. But if you read ahead, then you can fumble and make mistakes on what you're reading. So when you're speed reading, you really learn to read at the pace of a, of a skim. So it doesn't matter if you sort of miss words because you're getting the main gist of what you're looking at. Can't read that way. That was harder. I also found like 10 mistakes in there. <laughs> this is amazing. So anyway... You know, my name is on that book and it will be a book that Barb Higgins wrote in the eyes of all who read it forever and always, but it would never have come to fruition without Virginia. And I've thanked her several times, but I'll thank her here again. She was willing to sit and listen to my answers and to listen to them again and to transcribe the answers and organize the thoughts and ask the right questions. Nothing in that book is said in a way that I wouldn't have said it with the exception of a couple of English isms versus American isms. The way that that book reads is exactly how I would have said it. It's amazing. I'm blown away by it. So that's what I'm sharing today. I know this isn't a long episode. I I just have a lot of emotions. I'm heartbroken that Vinny has died. He was such a huge piece of my reality in 2016. And he's gone. And that makes me sad. And I'm sure his family is devastated and struggling. Big Ed has lost his dad and his grandmother in a week. That can't be easy. So I'll be sure to reach out for them. And if you're in my child loss community and you knew the Myers and didn't know that ER had passed away, send your love to that family because they could probably use it right now for sure. So I'm excited. I have a book. I'm holding it in my hands. Yes, I am holding it in my hands. And I have a lot of emotions around it and I'm not quite sure what to do next. Uh, So who knows? But anyway, I also would love, as this is happening, to hear from you on books about death and dying or grief or loss, or your spiritual beliefs, Bible verses, or Bhagavad Gita paragraphs, or Buddhist thoughts. There are so many religions in the world that are wonderful. What are thoughts and writings and readings on death that resonate with you? And if you're an atheist, how do you feel about death? Not all atheists believe that life just ends when the body dies. A lot of atheists absolutely believe that your your energy, your scientific essence stays, you know, continues. They just don't look at it as a soul or something related to God, which is perfectly fine. I think both descriptions merit truth. But I would love to hear what you think, what your thoughts are. That's another aspect of child loss. I have read and read and read all about death because I want to understand why it's okay for children to die when it's just not. That was a hard chapter for me to read. I'm going to go cry now. (laughs) That's what I'll do. I'm going to go cry now. Anyway, I'm going to end here because I'm a bit verklempt. ER. Mama Jules, Big Ed, Vinny, thank you, thank you, thank you for all you did for me in the time after Molly died all the way till now. Vinny, thank you for coming to me in my in my anesthetic dreams and making us all laugh. ER, thank you for calling me on the phone when I was having my brain tumors removed and spending time talking to me. Thank you for wanting to read the book. Mama Jules, thanks for holding your family together and for being the wonderful woman that you are. Big Ed, you should connect with Gracie sometimes. You guys have a lot in common you know, could provide support for one another. Kathy and Molly, Brandy and Jack, John and Nate, Lisa and Marilee, thank you for being a part of my reality and a part of my life. I appreciate it. And to all the people, moms and dads that have lost children recently or in the time since Molly's died around me, I'm here if you ever need a shoulder. I have two. They're old lady shoulders, but they hold tears very, very well. So anyway, do something good for somebody. And sometimes the best thing you can do for somebody who's grieving is to just sit and help them cry. You don't have to say a word. Just be with them. Be good to yourself. Sit and let yourself cry, right? So be good to yourself first. Let yourself cry. 
Be good to someone else. Sit and let them cry. And after all of that, do your very best thing and have a good day, everybody. Hey, thanks for listening and for supporting the podcast. Feel free to leave a review and to share my stories with your friends. Please reach out with your own stories. I love connecting with my listeners. If you want to see what I'm up to next, you can find me on Instagram at barb underscore 444, on Facebook as Barb Higgins, and at my website, a thousandtinysteps.com. And while you're there, sign up for my newsletter, a weekly way to find out what's up in the life of Barb Higgins.